Okay. Yes, he's happy. Get him while he's happy. You stand with me. What did it say about the audio? Oh, okay. We are going to start in just a moment, folks. Give us a moment to get everything ready to go, and we'll be right there. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Billy. Welcome, Chris. And welcome, Tony. All right. Are you on camera one? Click on the blue person. Hi, Linda from DeBerry. Hi, Sherry from Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, my sister lives in Spartanburg. Just a hop, skip, and jump away. I love Greenberg. Sorry, Greenville. Jane. We will be with you in just a moment. We are finishing up a few little details here. Can't wait to see you. Hang in there. We are we are waiting too, Jane Ann. There we go. All right. Are we live? <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is, I am Mary Janine Ibarguin, and this is little Nolan, and this is his granddad, Dad Mark. Hey, Mark. <laughs> and uh, we just wanted to say a quick hi, because I know all of you hi. wanted to see Kelsey's baby. He's, Kelsey, he's what? Six? Six months. Six months old. You are a big boy. Yes. And you have such a cute smile, and he's got two little teeth. I know I'm not putting anything in your mouth. <laughs> so we just wanted to say hi before we go find some fa hi. fabric for him to cut into fat quarters or something. Mary Janine has yes. to go to work now. Yes. Just and you so. got to go cut fat quarters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> All right. So you have joined Tips, Tools, and Techniques Club. I've got Kelsey here who's running tech for us. And please comment. Let us know where you are coming from. Yes, Sherry, we agree. He is adorable. We all love him. Um, and let's see, I've got a couple of announcements and we're gonna jump right in and start talking about some beautiful projects. Um, let's see, I'm supposed to tell you about a shop hop that is happening in November from the 17th to December 2nd, eight shops and it's called the Holiday Hot Pad Shop Hop. And I believe that means that you're gonna get a kit from every store to make a hot pad, which you can give away as Christmas gifts. And then if you hit all the stores on your passport, then you get put in for a, some grand prize. We're not quite sure what that's going to be yet. Um, and I let me back up and say, Tips, Tools, and Techniques is, a, is one of our clubs here at the sewing studio in Maitland that we try to inspire you to either use up your stash or to learn some new tips and find out about tools that you maybe not know about and some techniques. So hello, Anne from Tampa and wow, California, New Jersey. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I love that. They're all over the place. We had a session in the morning and I think I got all my bugs worked out. No matter how much I prepare for this morning, there's always a couple things that I've forgotten. So hopefully I've got it all right now. Um, my other announcement is that Mark just put a bunch of pre-loved sewing machines on a super sale. So you'll need to come in and check out all the beautiful uh, machines that have been serviced and are ready to go out the door so you can love them. So super sale on pre-loved machines. I also wanted to mention that I have a couple, well, three classes that have not filled yet. One of them is my quilting basics class. So if you or someone you know needs just A to Z, how to choose fabric, do I pre-wash my fabric, how to cut with a rotary cutter, I've got a whole lesson on rotary cutting, um, how to piece, how to chain piece. The next day, the next time we come back, it's three hours and three hours. The second three hours, we learn how to baste, quilt, and bind, and we make a little uh, placemat. So it's very, use, very doable, very usable. Everybody finishes the placemat by the end of six hours. Their brains are very full, 
And some people take the class two or three times because I throw so much information because I don't know where everybody's at in their quilting journey. So one person's like, yeah, I knew that. The other person has, I had no idea. So lots of good information. That's called Quilting Basics. It's happening in September and I'll be teaching it once in the fourth quarter as well. Terrace Tiles is a beginner class as well. It doesn't dive as deep into the basting and the quilting and the binding. Those are separate classes, but you will finish a quilt top in terrace tiles. That's one, uh, one seat left there. And then finally, some of you may not know, I have a finish it up class at the end of every quarter. And my idea is that maybe you've been working on a project that I've taught, but um, you've taken it home to finish it, you've hit a snag, you don't know what the next step is, you have a problem, you want to change things, whatever. If it's something that I have taught, either at Tips, Tools, and Techniques or in a class, feel free to bring it and I will help you finish it. So that is uh, all my announcements on that. We're going to jump right into the quilt. I've got some quilts and some quick projects today, but we're going to talk about this quilt um, that is... Uh, yeah, this is this was not a this was not a fast quilt. I love fast quilts. This was not it. But we're going to look, um, and I'm going to show you the block. There is one block. You see it, and that's where it goes. So there are 48 of these blocks, and they're kind of checkerboard. The pattern is called Twisted Logs by Nancy Mahoney. I, I told her uh, that I was going to be talking about this, so hopefully she can tune in and let us know, um, Nancy, if you're able to make it um, and give us any more insight on this quilt. But we're going to talk a little bit about paper piecing today. This is all sewn on paper. There was lots of leftovers, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so I used the leftovers to make the border. So that's very a very improv border. So we'll talk about that. We're going to talk a little, well, I might as well talk about the quilting now. You can't really see the quilting. I'm sure I'll leave this here and you'll be able to see the quilt up close and personal another time. But um, I wanted to quilt each pinwheel separately. Oftentimes, we go back to the regular. Oftentimes, when we think about quilting a quilt, we love continuous designs, right? We start in the corner and if, if the thread doesn't break and the needle doesn't break and the bobbin doesn't run out, you could quilt the whole thing in one in one shot. But whenever I make a pinwheel quilt, I've made many pinwheel quilts, I really like to quilt each pinwheel separately because it's hard to travel to the next one without your thread showing. So I quilted it, cut my thread. I didn't bury the thread on this one. I should have. I was a bad girl. I just cut it. Um, I knotted it and cut it and then went to the next one and quilted the same one. So I quilted the red ones in red and the white and black ones with a black thread. So you can't really see it, but there's a lot of quilting in there. Um, I did a separate design for the border quilting design that we can talk about, but let's talk about paper piecing a little bit now. And we're gonna do an overhead shot here. So here's the block. And as you can see, there are 21 pieces on this, or is it 20? Yeah, no, 21 pieces. So we're going to start in the center and you just keep working your way out. So I have a couple little samples here of how we got started. And by the way, let me back up for a second and tell you that when Nancy wrote this pattern, she gives you one sheet and you aren't going to sew on this sheet. You're going to make a bunch of copies and you're not going to do it on regular copy paper because when you go to sew fabric onto the paper, if you don't, um, and you have a small stitch, and when you go to tear the paper off to get it out of your quilt, if you're not using a thin paper, your stitches will tear, your stitches will stretch, it would be a bad thing. So what we do, and I forgot to go get a pack of, we have Carol Doak's um, foundation paper piecing paper, and it's in my favorites, which by the way, um, we'll, put up a, we'll put up a link in just a minute for my favorites. Kelsey's going to put up a link for my, my favorites page of the things that I'm talking about today. And she's also going to put up a link for my handout. And I'm not going to need the handout for a little while. So don't worry too much about it right now. But um, eventually you're going to want to print that handout out. Or if you happen to have two devices, you could pull the handout up on one device and uh, watch me on the other device. And Doreen, Deneen, that's an interesting name. Deneen is from O'Fallon, Illinois. Wow. And Crystal River. I'll be over in Crystal River. Um, well, I'll be in Hudson at a retreat um, in a few weeks. So we'll see you then. 
anyway, where were we? We're talking about uh, paper piecing. So we're, we're using a special paper. Um, so I cut this pattern out to make it a little smaller, a little easier to work with. And then I, the very first piece, if you're familiar with paper piecing, foundation paper piecing, I always say the first two pieces of foundation paper piecing are the hardest. So um, if you can figure out how to put the first and second piece on, the rest of it's gravy. So I like to use a glue stick to stick down this first piece just so I, it doesn't move. And then I can start putting down my, my pieces as I go around and around and around. You notice all the lines are straight, but the piece ends up looking like you've got some curves, which I think is fascinating. Um, you go from go from straight to curves. So there, Kelsey has put up my favorites page and she's put up the um, handouts, um, handout, if she will in a second, the handout so you can print that out. All right, so just a couple quick, uh, quick uh, in between stages here. So here it is, we've got uh, the center piece and I added my two reds, I took them to the iron. So I'm probably gonna do a bunch at the same time because then I can get up and iron all the reds to the side and then I'm gonna put my whites on. So here I've trimmed them to size. I actually started with a whole bunch of pieces that look like this and either whites and reds. So the pattern tells you what size those need to be and they're gonna, they're gonna have a lot left over at the beginning because those pieces that you sew are pretty small. So you're going to cut off extra, and I'm going to show you what we're going to do with those extra in a minute. So here it is. Here's my next set of red. And what I like to do, and I'm going to do a little quick little demonstration on how I trim this. I, I need to trim it. It's way too big, and I'm not going to be able to see the next line. So here's how I trim it. Better put my glasses on. All right, so I've got a, a ruler and a cutter. So what I do is I sew this line. So we're going we're gonna to cut a quarter of an inch away from the next line. So what I like to do is I like to fold on that next line. Make sure that's opened up. I press it first. And some people use a ruler called an add a quarter, which is perfectly fine. I don't. Um, I just, I use this edge of my ruler. And now that's been trimmed and I'm ready for the next piece. If I line, I put my next piece up against that edge and sew it, I'm gonna have a nice quarter of an inch. And I'm gonna do the same thing here. Fold it on the, on the next line and then cut a quarter of an inch away from it. And there, that's been trimmed. I didn't press it yet, but that's been trimmed. Now I can add my white. So I just keep going around and around until it looks like, where did I put it? It's in here somewhere. There you go, so it looks like that, okay. So now, Mary Janine, this is so wasteful because look at all these pieces you have left. What are you supposed to do with them? Well, that's where I, that's what I did with my border. I took one of these uh, Carol Doak sheets, newsprint, and I cut it into three equal width pieces. So 11 and a half by divided by three, whatever that is. Um, and there they are, there's my pieces. And this is how I'm gonna build my border. So I've already started with this one. I put my first red piece down and then I put a white piece on top of it, flipped it over, and that's how I'm gonna start building my border. This is very improvisational. And Kelsey, can we switch back to a close up over here so you can kind of see what this looks like? Um, it's very improvisational. None of the pieces, you can see none of the pieces are the same. This one, the point is missing, but that's okay. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but it all kind of works out in the end. I had to do some fun little thing for the corner. That's not in the pattern. This border is not in the pattern. It's something I came up with because I wanted my quilt to be a little bit bigger. You'll notice that my inner border is the same fabric as my binding because if you've been with me for a while, you know I love I love black and white stripes. Anytime I find a good black and white stripe, it's all mine. A couple, a couple, um, couple yards go into my stash. Pam, thank you. I, my travels were fabulous. We went to, um, I did some teaching in Pensacola in May and then headed up to Buffalo for a family thing. And then Canada, I tried to avoid the smoke as much as we could down to Mackinac Island and Door County. Oh, it's just lovely. And had a great time um, over to Maryland for another class and then home. So nine and a half weeks 
we were ready to be home, ready for the heat. Not re not ready for the heat, but ready for everything else. Um, yeah, so if there's any questions, I forgot to say this, but please, I love questions. So if you've got any questions, um, comment them and we'll put them up on the screen and we will answer them. So you know me, I love questions. And if, if you have that question, probably somebody else in the crowd has that question too. So um, as you can see, I had a lot of those little bits left over from my trimming. And this is all I had left. When I first started, this was mounded. And they have, that's all I have left um, from the border. So um, yeah, used up all those bits because I am a frugal person. If I can, I think most quilters are frugal. If you can figure out how to use the scraps, you will. So especially on the same quilt. So that again is twisted logs from Nancy Mahoney. She's got some great patterns. We have this available on my favorites page. So um, snag it. The only other thing you're going to need is Carol Doak's newsprint. And that's also on my favorites page. You get a 15% shopping discount on everything that you uh, buy today. It doesn't have to be part of this. Just anything you put in your basket, you'll get 15% off. If you use the code capital T, capital T, capital T. And we will, we will honor that 15% off until tomorrow at midnight, probably. It usually is. Um, we're missing Gabriella. She is actually out of the country and we are missing her. We're all kind of, she, we, we depended on her so much to just set everything up and do everything for us. And so we're all just kind of bumbling around. So, so forgive us, but, but we're, we're, uh, we're going to bring you some good content. That's what counts. All right. We are going to move to the next project, which is project bags, actually. So I saw this pattern decided I had to make it because I have a lot of uses for it. It's called Project Bags. If you have ever, um, if you have ever made a buy Annie project, uh, anything, you know how awesome. She probably writes the best patterns of any pattern I've ever, I have made hundreds of patterns and I, hers are the best, really. She, uh, there's, in so many ways, she explains everything fully. Um, there's no questions. If you read something, you may have to read it two or three times, but it's all there. Um, there's no, there's no questions about anything. She, her supply lists are very good. Um, and yeah, she even has videos usually in the pattern. You'll get a coupon for, uh, add on videos that are free if you buy the pattern. And so whatever you need a video for, for that particular thing. So she does like general, how to do binding. So if you, you can go look for that video and, and so forth. So um, highly recommend any of the buy any patterns, but today I'm going to talk about project bags. So what are project bags? They are very simple flat bags that, where are we? There we go. Very simple project uh, made with vinyl, clear vinyl, which we have pre-cuts of, and I'm pretty sure those pre-cuts are online. So this is the small size. Why don't we back it up a little? We'll just do the full size. Um, there we go. So this is the small. I have two mediums I made last night and then the large. So and then there's a jumbo, which I did not make because I ran out of time. But you can kind of see the different sizes. And I'm just going to tell you right now, this one I messed up. So it's not it's not going to be a sample at the store. But um, I the zippers on just a little bit crooked. But I just got a brand new Juki sewing machine and a brand new two-toe uh, polar uh, trolley, and I need something to put all the feet and all the pieces and parts. So this that's what's going home um, today for all my pieces and parts. So again, it's clear until you get to the bottom. So if you need have hidden stuff you need to keep from the public, all your chocolate, it can keep down there. And then you can see, and I love bags that are clear that you can see what's going on inside. Um, so let's, let's break this down a little. I'm not gonna go through step-by-step step on how to make it, of course but I just wanted to bring a few things to your attention. Um, the clear vinyl we have in three sizes, but to be honest, or three thicknesses, to be honest, this is probably the thinnest, but I'm not really sure it matters. She's, she may tell you what size, but really just go look at our vinyls. I'd say a 20 or a 16 gauge would be just fine for this project. Um, you're gonna need, uh, main fabric could be the same. In fact, this one, I put the same fabric on both sides. But you could also do, I did a smaller print on this side and a larger print on this side. And then I use that print for this bottom. Another thing the project allows you to do is to piece this bottom panel. So I did that on this one with the leftover K-facet fabrics. These, those are all K-facet. 
This is actually a Philip Jacobs uh, piece, and that's a cave. Um, my large one I made out of tulip pink piece uh, fabrics because 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 she's amazing. Um, and yes, and then even this piece down here. What I what you use for this inside back main piece is soft and stable. Some of you are familiar with soft and stable. Um, hi, Ann. Uh, Ann uh, Casper Morgan is commented and she she was the one who took in my quilts for Jacksonville. So do you guys know about the show in Jacksonville? It's September 14, 15 and 16, I believe. Yeah. And um, it's uh, six guilds. It's the best show in Florida, if you ask me. Six guilds. It used to be seven guilds. Put the show together. There's 450 quilts in this show. Tons of vendors. It's a never miss for me. The only two years I've missed it. And there was a hurricane one year. Jane Ann and I drove up in the middle of a hurricane, I swear. And we went to the show because the bus was canceled. But um, I missed it once a year for Croatia and one year for Italy. But other than that, I've been every year. Um, anyway, where were we? So Soft and Stable is an amazing product. Somebody was asking me this morning, why not just use uh, fusible fleece? Fusible fleece used to be what we used to use for purses and bags and things of this sort until Soft, soft and Stable came around. Um, I probably won't even think of all the reasons I love soft and stable, but for one thing, somebody brought a tote bag this morning with it. It stays, if you make a tote bag with soft and stable, it stays where you put it. It doesn't slouch down to the ground. It's, it's sturdy, right? It, it, but it's, it's like foam. So it's very stable. It doesn't mush around like batting some does sometimes. Um, so by Annie uses it, a lot of her products. It's just the bomb. I mean, I always have some on hand. Because maybe a tote bag or a you know a little box bag or something you can use, and it's seventeen dollars a yard, but it's a it's a big yard. It's a fifty four inch yard, but I just keep I buy a yard or two at a time, and I just keep eating pieces off of it for all my different projects. So once you get started with soft and stable, you won't want to use anything else. I guarantee it. It's the bomb. Um, hair in my eye. So. Soft and stable with fabric on both sides. You can quilt it however you want. I used a walking foot just to make life easy. You could certainly free motion as well. I wanna talk about zippers for a moment. Um, somebody asked, what kind of zipper? Well, if you've been garment sewing for a while, you're like, what's a zipper? It's a zipper, it's a zipper. Well, garment zippers are very thin and they have small little, little handles because, because it's a garment, you don't want your zipper showing. But, um, bag zippers are completely different. Um, they're going to have much bigger teeth. They're going to be very um, sturdy and lar the large teeth, they're you know plastic. I think one of the biggest differences is the teeth are always plastic, which means if you run over it with your needle, your needle won't complain, your needle won't break. Um, this happens to be a by Annie zipper. And I love how her colors are always spot on, fashion forward. They're going to go with all the latest fabrics. So you've got, if you've got some latest tulip pink and you're like, which zipper? There's probably gonna be like five different colors that are gonna go with. This pink goes really well, but look, this green goes pretty well too. Um, I just happened to pull that. But so the nice thing is her zippers are 30 inches long. This is actually folded in half and she's got two heads on it. So in the pattern, she actually tells you how to use a 30 inch zipper, put one head over here and one head over here and where to cut and then you have one zipper for two bags. So that's a that's a nice value there. So that's a Biani zipper. We've also got, um, is this a YLI or, yeah, YKK, sorry. Um, zip, we have a ton of YKK zippers and they're all different kinds. So you gotta read the little, little tag up here. This one happens to be a separating zipper, which maybe you really like the color or the size. So you go ahead and buy the separating. Maybe you don't need a separating, but you know, it's not gonna harm anything to use a separating zipper. I'm going to put this back together, which is very simple. Um, so you got sometimes you just buy it for the color or the size. But again, a nice big um, handle. And these are nice and big because by Annie has a really nice little thing where she always gives you a little, um, you make a little tag or what is this zipper pull. So it makes it easier to pull the zipper. So part of the pattern includes that zipper pull. So every, every one. So if the, um, if the zipper pull isn't big enough to put two, two layers through, then it's big enough for one layer and you just tie it a different way. This was not a buy any zipper. This was just out of my stash. And so 
Um, it's so I, I still have a zipper pull, but it's put on there differently. Another idea for a zipper, we have either two or three different of these um, zipper by the yard and lots of colors, of course. And I love how they're starting to do, even though it's plastic, it looks metallic and they have them in rainbow and all kinds of beautiful metallics. So that's an idea. So you buy zipper by the yard, you buy the size you need, or sorry, the color you need. And then you, in, you put the, they have a little video usually on, on how to put these heads on. So for me, last night I was having trouble remembering how to put this, this was zipper tape. So I went ahead and just loaded all the rest of my zipper heads right on the roll and then just put it away. So next time I need one, the zipper head's already installed and I don't have to, I don't have to worry about um, uh, matching up, matching up my zipper heads later on. So, and then we also, somebody came by today and said, I love this zipper, but I've run out of heads and we have just the heads. So you can buy extra heads. If you think you're going to use it like a lot of zippers out of one length, you can buy some extra zipper heads. So I hope that helps. Um, yep. And 450 quilts. That's what I saw. Um, it's going to be a great show. I hope you guys can make it up to Jacksonville. I'm going up on Thursdays. So if you get there on Thursdays, come and say hi. I'm the, I'm the six foot lady that's walking around. Um, <laughs> um, so, oh, one other thing I wanted to talk about in regard to the um, pockets. I want to talk about wonder clips. Uh, th this morning when I asked if anybody had wonder clips, probably two thirds of the people had wonder clips. So hopefully most of you love wonder clips as much as I do. When they first came out, I'm like, yeah, I'll just use my binder clips. I'm good. And then somebody gave me a package of them and I can't, I, I use them pretty much daily for all kinds of different projects. If you are going to work with any kind of vinyl, clear vinyl or jelly vinyl or faux leather or anything like that, you pretty much have to have wonder clips. Why? You do not want to be putting pins through plastic or vinyl because they are not going to heal like fabric will. So if I want to sew this together, I'm going to have to clip it together with my wonder clips. So wonder, let's do an overhead shot. Wonder clips that I know of, Kelsey, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, that I know of come in three different sizes. We've got large, medium, and, and the small. Um, and both of them have, all of them have different uses. I have some of each. I have a hundred of these and a few of the others, and they're all really handy. Things do not slide. So sometimes even with a binder clip, I find things slide sometimes. You clip, these are very strong. Yes, they're a little pricey, but you will never have to replace them. They do not break. One more thing, you'll notice that um, there's a flat side and a rounded side. So I use the flat side on the bottom next to the sewing machine bed. So um, everything slides nice and flat. So they all wonder clips are like that. So they're in my favorites as well. And we'll post a, post a link to Mary Janine's favorites. So you can um, go get yourself some wonder clips if you don't have any. Um, oh, and one more thing about wonder clips that I use them for. My, my box of 100 is slowly disappearing because when you, this is really important. If you've never made a buy any bag, really any bag that has lots of pieces and parts, it is really important to identify all the pieces that you start cutting. She, you look at this pan, this page is all filled with all the different pieces you need to cut. And it looks like a lot, but really you're just gonna do one column, small, medium, large, jumbo. All right, so in the back of the pattern, she gives you a sheet and every single square corresponds to one piece. Either it's your main fabric or your lining fabric or your soft and stable or your coordinating fabric or your vinyl or your fusible interface. Not only it tells you the size, so this is for the large bag, it tells you which fabric, it tells you what the item is called because you'll need that for the pattern, and then it tells you the size. So I got lazy and after a while and was just using that number instead of all these numbers here, where sometimes it's hard to read. The exception for that is in this particular pattern, there's a cutting layout for the coordinating fabric. So you lay out your fabric and if you cut it this way, then you'll have enough fabric. If you don't follow her layout, you may not have enough fabric because it may be chopped up into weird sizes. So I like to use her layout for when, it, when she offers it. So the point here is that you make a copy of this and here we go. These are all the squares I need to make a large 
to make a large bag. And I've kept them because if I ever want to make the large bag again, I don't have to recopy and recut. They're all there. And I would just sort them out for the different types of fabric. So there's my clip. I guess I could use a binder clip there, but I've used my wonder clips. So there's my mediums. I have double because I made two bags at the same time. And there's another tip for you. A buy any bag, it's not a short process, but it's so rewarding. So if I'm making a sample for the store, and we can back it up. If I'm making a sample for the store, I will often make a second buy anything, whatever it is for myself, because we'll hang it in the store for a while. It's like, no, I really want that. So I'll make a second one for myself. Um, and But it's easy if you make it parallel. So, okay, we sew this seam here and we sew this seam here and we sew that seam there and we sew that seam there. So it takes just a little bit more time to make a whole nother thing. So I end up doing that quite often. So then I will have two sets of little squares, one for each of the projects. So yeah, any questions? We put up the uh, my favorites page and let's let's put up the handout one more time, Kelsey, because I'm about to start talking about um, handout projects. So if you haven't, if you just joined us and you haven't uh, printed out the handout, I would encourage you to either print out your handout or put it on a second device so you can follow along. That one aside. So we're going to talk about this quilt. And this quilt is the one that's on the front of your handout. I have to excuse me for a second because all of a sudden my throat is very dry. All right. So I don't know. I don't know. But I, I feel like this quilt came out, came out even better than I'd hoped. Um, if you know me and you've heard me talking for a while, you may know that I love collecting thrifted cotton shirts, and I happen to collect them in reds, lights, and blues in stripes and plaids. There's a lot of other stuff out there I just ignore. I also collect greens, but we'll talk about greens in a minute. Um, so red, white, and green. But so I, so when I get a shirt, wash it, debone it, which is just cutting off the um, side seams and all that, I get rid of all the side seams. And then I cut them up in various sizes. I'll cut up 10 inch squares, eight inch squares, some different sizes, or I'll just leave it flat. And then later I'm like, oh, I wanna make a quilt with six and a half inch. So I'll cut a bunch of six and a half inch squares. But anyway, somebody asked me how many shirts were in this. I really have no idea. But when I put it on electric quilt, electric quilt told me I needed a yard total of the darks and then four yards of the light. So that's all I can tell you. I have no idea how many shirts went into this because I just have piles of shirts um, that have all been deboned and ready to go. So I forgot to bring a block to show you, but I've got a little demo here of how to make it. So we're going to do an overhead, Kelsey, because I have a very cool ruler I want to tell you about. And I will tell you that the ruler, um, it, well, it might be in the mail today. We haven't checked. Um, but we, these is, this is called the Clearly Perfect Slotted Trimmer. I love this so much. You know, oftentimes there are uh, rulers out there that we talk about and it's good for one quilt or maybe two quilts. You will be using these for the rest of your life. Um, there are lots of different ways to make half square triangles. But when they get to be a certain bigger size, it's some of the pro some of the different ways are hard to go to use. But so that's why I like these rulers. They're here. Yeah. Oh, does Melinda know? Um, so we need to. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna make sure they're available on my favorites page. Um, so what I've got here before I start cutting, this is uh, I don't know I, I have it in the handout, but it's probably a seven inch square. Well, here I can tell you. Let's try the one. So it's a seven and a half an inch, seven and a half inch square. I'm sure you, most of you know about that. You draw a chalk line from corner to corner, you sew on either side, and now you cut. So I'm gonna use my ruler here to cut on the chalk line. So now I have two half square triangles. The problem is it's a mess. There, it's, it's not the right size at all. And a lot of trimming methods, you have to open this up, carefully press it, and then cut all four sides down to the right size. And 
this is the reason I love the clearly perfect slotted trimmer. We're just going to call it the slotted trimmer for short. I want this to be a six and a half inch square. So I'm going to hear this particular ruler has six and a half. And by the way, between these two rulers, you have 11 different size half square triangles. That's what's so brilliant about this. You get two trimmers for one price and you can do 11 different sizes. So I'm gonna do this six and a half size, Oop, down a little bit. So I'm going to line up the little dotted line where it tells me to on my sewing line. My sewing line is actually not very good, but I'm gonna do the best I can and that's good enough. And I'm going to cut there and because I'm oops I'm off the paint off the board here I'm gonna redo it um, and now I'm gonna cut the other side um, it's called a slotted trimmer because it's got places where you can cut off your dog ears but since this is the biggest one it just has a little triangles here and I'll be honest I don't actually use those very often if I were to cut this well let's just do it let's just say I need, a, I need something this size. So I'm gonna cut this and cut this. Okay, so they got a slot there. So you can put your, put your cutter in there and get, get, get it, get cut off the dog ears right there. But as you can see, it takes a little while, but what we're doing with the dog ears is when you open it up, there's no little points coming out. That's what dog ears are. So the slots, I don't know if you can see the slots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they allow you to cut off. But to be honest, what I usually do is I cut my triangle, I'm gonna do it like this. We're gonna cut, I'll do another one. And I'm not gonna cut off the dog ears that way. I'll show you another way that I cut up. And yes, I'm doing it ambidextrous. You don't have to, of course, do it ambidextrous. You can um, angle it a little bit and then you cut this way and you cut that way with one hand. I was just being lazy. But what I do is I go back later and just kind of eyeball those dog ears off. Same thing and you're not using the slots, but you can of course use the slots if you want. So there's my half square triangle. Hopefully that made sense. Clean up all this. Um, yeah, so now we've got half square triangles and then, and then we're gonna add on all the other pieces for the block and then we'll take another quick look at the quilt. Here's my short one. So that's, that's gonna be the corner of the block. So you're going to attach all the light pieces to the, I think I, I cut this one short, but you get the idea. So let's head back up to the quilt, Kelsey. Um, so you can see this is, where are we? There we go. So this is a block right here, right? So it really only has two sets of logs. And I give you the size of these logs. I believe they're cut two inches wide. Um, and they all go on the light piece of that the light side of that half square triangle. So it's kind of a log cabin. It is a log cabin. It's just a slightly different. And I'm calling this barbed wire because that, to me, that's what it kind of looked like. Your quilt doesn't have to be reds and blues, of course. This, this could be all the same color. The darks could be all the same color. It could be a bunch of different colors. It doesn't have to be an offset like mine, a barn raising. It could be, it could be straight on. It could be way up in the corner. Um, so Judy says she's got the rulers, never used them, and now she knows how to use them. Yes. Um, anyway, I just, I'm really thrilled with the way this came out. And I think part of it is just the colors, but I just love the high contrast of the lights and the darks. So are there any questions about anything I've mentioned so far? Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, so, um, yeah. And then I didn't put a border on it. Quilted it, oh, um, quilted it with, or I backed it with flannel. Um, I'm gonna talk some more about this little guy, but this is called, I call it a quilt pocket. Um, if you're familiar with um, quillows, that's really what a quillow came from. It's a quilt that goes into a pillow. But I found that with my cotton, and especially this one with the flannel, it's the quilt is too big to go into the pocket. However, I love it because if I know this is going to be a couch quilt, then we have uh, leather lazy boys and you put a quilt on your feet and everything's the bottom of the quilt slides off. But if, if you put your feet in the pocket, then the quilt can't fall off your lazy boy. Yes, that's how lazy we are. Um, so I'm going to talk more about how to make it, but I just wanted to show you this one um, it has 
it's quilted actually. It's like a little quilt that you attach to the back of your quilt. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but I just wanted to mention that one. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to take this one down. You guys have to ask me questions or at least tell me where you're from. I need some input. I need to know you're out there. We're going to close this all up. All right, where were we? Oh, so we're going to talk about this one. And then after that, I have two more, two more quick things to talk about. Um, so this is called my improv trees, and it is an improvisational quilt, right? Uh, similar, kind of a, the same improvisational idea as my border on the last, on the red and white quilt. Um, where was I? Where am I? Okay, here we go. Improv trees. Um, I actually used a tutorial that I give you the link for, so I don't tell you exactly how to make this. I'm going to do a demo, but it's not on the handout because the demo was all there. The, the um, tutorial is all online, um, and I've got the link there for you. But what I did is give you a few extra tips of things that I have found as I'm working along. Are there kits for the quilts? Danine, I'm not sure which quilt, if any, but not any of the quilts that I'm showing you today. But, you know, the way I teach, the way I teach these things is it's your idea to use up your stash or to come in for your darks or lights or whatever. But um, I try to show patterns that you can use any kind of fabric. So rather than a kit, um, thank you, Sam, rather than making a kit, I encourage you to, to shop your stash or come in and find some, find some new fun fabrics. Hope that helped. All right. Um, okay, back to improv trees. What is improv? What the heck is she talking about? So normally when we're making quilts, everything's got to be exact, right? You got a scant quarter of an inch. Everything's going to fit. If you follow the directions, everything's going to fit perfectly. Your star points are going to be perfect. Um, well, Deneen says she doesn't have fabric. Kelsey, I think we can help her with that. <laughs> um, Let's see. So improv means that I don't care about quarter of an inch. I don't care about things matching and it's all going to work out. So let me do a demo. Let's um, when we may end up making one block, you've actually make two blocks at a time. And you'll notice one of the reasons it's improv is all the trees are slightly. This is actually my favorite tree of all the trees on this quilt just because it's cute and it's tall and it's different. So um, every tree can be different skinny and you know what this is kind of a no that's different from that one um but you you can see they're short there's fat ones there's skinny ones there's tall ones so let's do a quick little demo let's do an overhead shot on how to do this quilt all right so here's the block we're going to leave it up here to kind of you can kind of see see what that looks like there there we go um, and then we're going to start with, and, and again, the instructions are all in the online tutorial and the, in my handout, it has a link, but we've got need two fabrics, right? We need background and we need a tree fabric. So here it is. We're going to put both of these right side up. So my green is right side up, not wrong side up. And this is actually, it's a shirting. So it's the same on both sides. Maybe I like, maybe it's a little suedeier on one side. So I'm going to decide that's my front, but it really doesn't matter. Okay. I'm going to cut this. I'm going to make two cuts and here they are. And I'll put them, a, whoops, like this and like this. So I put them apart a, a, a little bit so you can see where the cuts are. The first cut is going to be here pull that off to the side and the second cut will be not to the top because I, I want a little top on my tree. My tree needs a little bit of, needs a little bit of air on top. So two cuts, one, two, all right? I'm gonna take this two pieces here and I'm gonna flip them around and there's my two blocks, almost, almost. So I'm gonna sew. So the order that I cut them, I'm gonna sew them in the opposite order. So I made, this is my first cut and this is my second. So I'm gonna sew that seam first and that seam second. All right, so here we are through the magic of television. There we go, there's one, right? So then, and actually I've got, a, I've got an in-between shot here. Um, we've got two of those, and then we haven't sewn the border on, the 
background on, but we're going to do that. And I encourage you to, again to, uh, to chain piece these if you want to. So there's my tree. We'll put those aside. So there it is, but it's missing something. It's missing a little, it's missing a little trunk. And we put that on lastly, because if my tree ends up being way to the left or way to the right, I don't want to cut my trunk until I know where it's going to be. So if it's going to be over here, I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut my strip separately. So here's my strip of background. And once I figure out where I want it, then I'm going to cut and insert my little trunk in between the two pieces, trim that off, sew them together. And now I've got a whole tree that I'm going to trim off. I give you a number, the, the size, it looks like seven by nine and a half. Yours may be a little smaller, maybe a little bigger. When I do improv sewing like this, my numbers rarely come out just like the person who wrote the pattern, but that's okay. It's improv. It doesn't matter. It's all going to be beautiful. So as long as you make all those blocks the same, let's, let's get a big picture of the quilt again, Kelsey. Um, you can see, you could even sew these. Um, you see all my blocks are the exact same size, but you know, you can make them different sizes and line them up different ways. I, um, I'll be bringing a quilt. I can't remember if I'm bringing my bird quilt, either September or October, and it's going to be another improv idea, but they won't be set up, my blocks won't be set up like this. They'll be set up a little differently because all the blocks will be slightly different sizes. So, hi, Elaine. Um, yep, Deneen, if you if you live locally, come take my Quilting Basics class and I'll, and I'll teach you a few tricks. I've got four tricks on how to select fabric to go well in a quilt together. So come and, and I'll teach you how to do that. Um, I use leftover bits for the border. So I have just a simple piano key border there. And I actually purchased a green, um, green plaid there from the sewing studio because I needed, I needed yardage for the binding and the inner border. So, um, so this quilt, actually, I'm thinking about it now. It's a lot like that red and white quilt. It's got improv, well, not improv, but it's got something in the center. And then I use the same fabric for both of these. And then interesting piece border. It doesn't have to be a piece border, of course. I just wanted to use all my leftover little bits up. So hopefully, um, you know, this quilt, I've seen it done in so many different colors. If you're on social media, um, and I gave you the hashtag that the, the person likes us to use, it's hashtag um, holiday patchwork forest, and you will see a ton of these quilts. They're super popular around the holidays. I'm not sure if I've ever put, put this one online. I should. But um, I've seen it done in blues and whites. It's gorgeous. I've seen it done in very scrappy. It's gorgeous. It doesn't have to be a Christmas quilt if you're not into Christmas or you've got enough Christmas quilts. It could be anything. It could be fall. It would be gorgeous in fall colors. So I encourage you to um, use that hashtag and look around and, and uh, make one. And it doesn't have to be a big quilt. It could be a little pillow. It could be a tote bag. All right. I've got two more things to talk about. So you've got a few more chances to ask any questions that you might have. One of them is um, the foot pocket. So we talked a little bit about this, but not really. So here's another um, foot pocket. I'm trying to turn this quilt around so you can see it. What size? Um, there's really no magic size. I probably wouldn't make it smaller than 15 by 15 unless you're doing it for a little children's feet. Um, it looks like I used almost the size of a fat quarter for this. I was trying to use this whole back is filled with old, 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 old fat quarters that I needed to use up. Um, so basically, it's like a little quilt. Front, batting, backing. I bound it on three sides. I quilted it. And then I bound it on side, top, and side. And then when you're putting the binding on the whole quilt, you include that in the actual binding of the whole quilt. So it's actually bound on four sides by the end, if that makes sense. Um, again, it, probably make it as big as you can just for lots of big, big feet. Um, then finally, you have to sew up those sides. If you're super lucky, the front of your quilt would allow you to machine sew those sides down, but that hasn't happened yet to me. I haven't been lucky enough. So I hand sew the sides of the pocket down Make sure you tack it up here really well to make sure it doesn't tear out. And then just, just carefully hand sew it down. If your stitches show, no big deal. Um, I actually hid my stitches kind of under the binding. Um, but yeah, so that's been hand sewed down. And I know some of you say hand sewing is a bad word. Get over it. You can do this. All right. 
So that is, and there's a handout there. The third handout is the quilt back pocket. So I encourage you to read through that, get some good ideas. And finally, we're going to do overhead shot because I want to, I have a few binding tips I want to share with you. I teach a binding class and I teach a, um, which is full this quarter, but I'm doing it again next quarter. I always teach binding classes. And then in my quilting basics, we do the exact same binding, which is kind of quicker. But I have some tips. The first tip is how wide do you cut your binding? First, when I first started quilting, um, some people use two and a half. I was using two and a quarter, which worked pretty well. But then I noticed that I really like thin cotton select, quilters cotton select batting. And it's so thin that my binding was too big and it was covering too much of my quilt, of the front of the quilt. And sometimes that's okay. But if you have like pieced triangles or something that's coming to the very edge, you don't want to cut off those points by binding that's too big. So I had to come up with a better number. So now my current number is actually two and a quarter, sorry, two and an eighth inches um, of uh, wide. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, and hopefully you'll be happy to hear this if you don't know this, you do not need to press your binding in half before you attach it to the quilt. And for some of you are like, of course, I knew that. But some of you are like, I, I didn't know that. You, I thought you have to press it. Here's why, here's why I don't. And I have not been pressing my binding in half for probably 15 years and I've never looked back. Here's the reason. Once you attach your binding to the quilt and when you flip that binding around to the front, if you think about it, there's a little less fabric needed on the inside than on the outside of the binding. And if I have a hard fold there and I bring that over, binding's not gonna be nearly as, nearly as happy as if you just leave it unpressed and let it do its own thing. It's gonna lay much nicer, I think. So give it a try. Plus you won't burn your fingertips when you're trying to fold it in half and press it. So give it a try and not press your binding and see what happens. Okay, so here's a little quilt. I've quilted, I'm sorry, I've sewed should have had a different front and back, but I didn't. But anyway, I've sewed my binding to the back of my quilt. I'm going to bring it, well, before I bring it around to the front and talk about the mitered corners, I got to teach you how to, how to finish this off. When I first started binding a quilt 35 years ago, um, the ladies at the Quilt Guild were very careful about teaching us how to, you cut this off and then you measure and then you pin and then you, you cut, you sew this on a bias and Yes, I do that sometimes, but most of the time I do the fast and easy MJ way. So I, that's what I wanted to show you today. Um, so the first thing I do is I'm going to start in the middle of my project, my quilt, whatever it is. I go all the way around, finish up this corner, and I give myself four to five inches of free space here. And I'm going to take this first part and I'm going to cut at a, at a 45 degree cut. And I'm going to fold this in. This is going to be what I call your faux seam, F-A-U-X, pretend fake seam. And actually, I finger press this down. And, you know, you go to quilt shows and there's, a, there's usually somebody there doing a demonstration of a binding tool. It's $24.99 binding tool. You'll have beautiful binding. Don't we all want beautiful binding? I'm here to tell you this is my binding tool, a pin any kind of pin, it doesn't have to be a flower pin, any kind of pin, one pin for my binding technique. And this is what I do. I use it in other places as well, but here's where I use it here. I put a pin right here, try not to poke myself um, and kind of finger press that down. So it's a, hopefully you can see that. And then I take this piece, I had a pair of scissors and I have, do you have a pair of scissors up there? I know I laid them somewhere. Thank you. Um, we probably moved them for the baby or something. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to be very, very careful to cut my fabric, but not too short because it's got to make it inside there. So I'm just going to eyeball it. And guess what? It doesn't have to be a 45. It just has to be a little bit of an angle because you don't want a straight piece because you don't want a lump in your quilt, but it doesn't have to be at a 45. And so that's going to get tucked in. 
and then this was all sitting on my machine. When you first do it, you probably want to take it off and work on it. But eventually, you're going to stop your needle right here, leave it right there, or maybe pull it a few inches to yourself, do this, and then finish sewing all the way. And this pin holds down that little weird thing, and you're just going to finish that. When you go to turn it around, I'm just going to pin it in a different way so I can show you. When you go to pin this around, turn this around, if you do it right, it's going to look great. It's going to look like that was a sewn seam and no one will be the wiser unless you tell them. Okay, so that's how we finish it. And if you didn't catch that, I said all the words. So just hit rewind when you're done and watch it again. But uh, what, the final thing I want to show you is how we turn a corner. So we mitered those, mitered those corners the way you usually do. Here I am. I like to use a, like a serpentine or some, some little decorative stitch that doesn't take up too much thread. And I'm sewing along. Normally when I'm sewing along, when I first started doing this, I'd sew to the end and I'd bring up my corner in miter. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. But then you turn the corner and you try, even with a walking foot, you're trying to go uphill and it's a mess. You end up adding all this extra thread and it's a big old hunky mess. So now I've learned, I bring up the bottom first, bring over the side, and it's a beautiful miter, and you're going downhill when you go around the corner instead of uphill. One more thing, when you bring that up, you're gonna wanna bend the fabric right at the end of the quilt, and that will give you a beautiful mitered corner every time. Um, I have students that say, Every time I get three good looking corners and one bad one, well, that happens. I promise you, eventually you'll get four good looking corners. It just takes practice. But definitely the downhill, not the uphill will help too. That is everything. Sherry, I thank you for saying a walking foot. I did forget to say that. Whenever you're sewing more than two layers together, we always use a walking foot. Um, we could do a big picture here, Kelsey. Um, always use a walking foot. So if I were to quilt, I'd be using a walking foot with straight lines. Binding, definitely a walking foot. You might want to uh, use a 90, a size 90 needle just to go through all those layers instead of an 80. Sometimes I forget and use my 80 and it's okay, but 90 is probably better. Um, yeah, so hopefully you all went home or going home or leaving your leaving this with, with an idea, a new technique or a new tip. Again, the discount for buying anything online today is TTT, all uppercase. If you decide you want to come in and look at fabric as well, just say to the um, lady at the register, TTT, and she will give you 15% off all day today. If you're online, it'll be all day tomorrow as well. You're welcome, Sherry. We are very glad to do that. I'm very glad to be back after three months away. So we will. I will be here September and October. November and December are too close to the holidays, so we're going to take a break on that, and then I'll have lots of new stuff for you in January. So with that, um, hi, Pat, um, with no further ado, I think that's everything. So I'm going to let you go, get on with your Saturday, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.